on episode 31 of the Insure Tech Geek podcast, talking about reducing safety claims with tech and data with Tom West from Make You Safe. The InsureTech Geek Podcast, powered by JB Knowledge, is all about technology that is transforming and disrupting the insurance world. We'll be interviewing guests and doing deep dives into specific technologies that we see changing the industry. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech, so enjoy the ride and geek out. Yeah, first video episode of the Insure Tech Geek Podcast. That's right. So for those of you who've been listening just on audio, we now have a video channel. You'll see it on Vimeo. Of course, you can just go to insuretechgeek.com and you'll have links to all of those uh, show notes and all kinds of other fun things. But uh, this is the first video episode. And with his beautiful face, oh my goodness, the most interesting man in insurance, Rob Galbraith. Rob, good to see you. It's good to see you, James. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad that uh, the listeners now, the viewers, kind of get to see what what life is like behind the microphone all this yep. time. You you haven't seen us, but but uh, we've right. been on video this whole time to yep. talk with our guests, and uh, so now you get to see what we see. So I'm real excited. Yeah, so it's a uh, it's now it, we're going to still do the audio podcast. We have a we're going to have a video feed. It's going to be on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, um, and yeah, it'll be on LinkedIn. Post from Vimeo. Until LinkedIn finally approves my ability to live stream, I can't believe they 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 still haven't rolled this out into production for everybody. It's insane. Like they're like they always wait like three years until out after other social networks do something. And they're like, okay, fine, we'll do live video. I mean, it's insane. I'm so tired of it. Yeah. So here, so, this you you are you are in Casa Benham. Got my guitar collection. That is a Lego city behind me. I'm a hardcore Lego, Lego addict, and I do have a whole city. So just for those of you who are watching on video. If you're not, I can, of course, describe the room in detail. I'm not going to do that to you, though. With us from beautiful Iowa, land of corn and rolling fields. I've, I've been to Iowa a few times. Mr. Tom West from Make You Save. Tom, it's good to see you as well. You too. Thanks very much for having me on. Uh, glad we're not having a, a derecho today. <laughs> Nice. So we'll we'll come back to you in just a second. I want to remind you out there before we get started with the interview, don't forget you you can subscribe to the Insure Tech Geek podcast just by texting geek out G E E K O U T geek out to 66866. Make sure you never miss an episode. We'll email you every week with just the show notes, the details and the link to watch it or listen to it. Of course, it'll be video and audio. Just text geek out to 66866. Now back to our guest Tom West. Make you safe. Tom, how are you going to make me safe? No, we're not going to talk about that just yet. We're not going to talk about that just yet. Um, we're, we're going to talk about what Make You Safe does later. Now I want to talk about you. Um, you've got an interesting background going all the way back through uh, hotels and media and teaching and you know Des Moines, Des Moines Area Community College, your marketing professor for, for quite some time, uh, almost 20 years. Uh, you, you, you've really had a diverse career. So what is it that you envisioned yourself doing when you were a, uh, a young buck going to University of Miami? Uh, you know, what led you to – now, are we talking about Miami or Miami of Ohio first? got to ask that. Oh, Coral Gables, Florida. Coral University Gables, the, yeah. The, the, the U, the U. Okay. So when you were looking at going to the U, what is it that you thought you were going to do with your career, and then what led you to this point? Uh, that's a really good question. I think I've always been uh, entrepreneurial-minded. Um, so – uh, I started my career uh, in the hospitality industry, uh, put myself through school, uh, swiftly uh, moved into uh, training capacity uh, and found that uh, I really enjoyed being a teacher, uh, a lot of teachers in my family. Um, so I've spent most of my career in HR uh, or learning and development or training space and uh, ended up moving to Des Moines, Iowa, where uh, there was a uh, world-leading uh, producer of learning and development content called American Media Incorporated. So I got to uh, be part of that organization for quite some time. Uh, we uh, grew to be the largest in the world. 
And uh, I was right in my wheelhouse, right? Uh, uh, being able to uh, teach managers and supervisors uh, uh, about communication with the front lines and best practices and how to be better leaders. And that's kind of what I spent my, my life doing, I guess. Uh, from there, I've been an executive uh, member of the leadership team with many companies that produce um, organizational development or leadership development tools and training tools and even technology platforms uh, and marketed uh, those. And then, yeah, you're right. Actually, it was for almost 30 years. Um, I was an adjunct professor at a uh, local uh, college teaching management, marketing, and uh, entrepreneurial uh, classes there. So I feel pretty fortunate that this part of my life, I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing. Um, and, and I appreciate uh, small startup ventures and what it takes to uh, help grow them. So, yeah. That's, and and teaching teaching is fun. I mean, you, you I I I just finished my fifth year as an adjunct professor at Texas A and M, and I, I I had a five year deal and I completed it. I'm 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 taking a break from it now. Um, I love teaching. I love it. It is. It can be exhausting though. So it, to do in addition to a regular job. So so I, I decided to take a little break. But I, I I think it's really cool how much you learn from your students and how much they teach you through the process. And of course, having to teach something forces you to learn it well. I mean, it should, by the way. <laughs> it doesn't always, right? There are bad teachers out there. But good teachers who teach for almost 30 years aren't kept around because they're they're slackers of teaching. I mean, you, you had to really learn your subject matter to be able to relate to other people. Yeah. Um, practicing what you preach, uh, I believe, is important. And I think that's something I brought into the classroom. I was a business leader. I, I was an employer. So, you know, teaching management to students was uh, really enjoyable. I got a lot out of it. So, James, imagine, at, you know, at over the age of 50, deciding to become an employee of one of your students. Well, I've had some really amazing students that I've really stayed in touch with. And, and there's a couple where I could probably envision that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but me, it, in 28 years, there was one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and about 15 years ago, uh, a, a guy who was showing up in my night class who was obviously tired because he's working a couple of jobs and had a young family uh, came up to me at the end of class one day and said, I, I really like where you're coming from. I have a business plan. Would you mind taking a look at it? And that's how I met uh, Gabriel Glenn. And uh, that was uh, many years ago. I helped him with uh, his first venture. And we've been uh, uh, very close friends uh, ever since. And when it comes to Make You Safe, when he had the idea on the back of a cocktail napkin, uh, I may have been one of the first people he told. I was an early advisor and investor in the company. And then, interestingly, he called me one day and said, I know it's Saturday, but can you start on Monday? I need another me. So I put aside my own businesses and things I was doing and came on board, uh, which I wouldn't have done for anybody else, uh, uh, to help Gabe with Make You Safe. And I've been on the team for, I don't know, a little more than three years now. And that's a wonderful segue. Tell me what Make You Safe does. Like, walk me through the solution, the technology behind it, and what problem it solves. Yeah, thanks for asking. If you don't mind, I'll I'll take this tack as a sailor. <laughs> the origin of our company really is founded in the idea that we don't have to or shouldn't have to wait for people to experience injuries or have incidents or uh, claims to occur in order to uh, have intelligence that ought to help us prevent those incidents in the first place. So proactively, preventatively, uh, we ought to be able to identify things uh, that are hazards and risks so that we can uh, manage those things uh, before people uh, are impacted, sometimes for life. So uh, Make You Safe has created innovative wearable technology that uses numerous sensors on board. And I don't know if you can see here clearly, but I'm wearing our armband. Um, numerous sensors on board this very small device that's about the size of my thumb to collect data that can be useful uh, and have predictive value in understanding uh, the risks and hazards that industrial workers face. 
And we provide that data via our software platform to safety leaders and also to uh, loss control departments and safety experts employed by insurance companies so that they can help mitigate risk before people get hurt. And, and you're, you're actively monitoring them, improving your algorithms, analyzing movement and behavior, and then identifying risk factors so you can give them real-time feedback? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Uh, I kind of like to talk about the data that's collected on the wearable, uh, not in terms of the numerous sensors, but in, in four types of data that we're collecting. So first would be data about environmental conditions. Things like temperature, humidity, low light levels, Uh, they may sound kind of simple. On the other hand, they have a dramatic impact on people's productivity, when they're experiencing fatigue, when heat exhaustion conditions are mounting. Um, We've got things like uh, air quality sensors on board. Uh, We've got a microphone on the device that detects Uh, sound exposure for workers. If you've ever been in an industrial environment, you know that those environmental conditions may actually change depending on which side of a machine you're standing on. So you can be, you know, 10 feet away from another worker who's experiencing dramatically different conditions than you are. Um, So that would be first, environmental conditions. Secondly, we're also detecting potentially harmful human motion. That was a natural place for us to start with slips and trips and falls accounting for so many workplace accidents. But we use accelerometers on the device, and we can also uh, detect things like pushing and pulling that may be an exertion uh, injury waiting to happen. Third would be the location of where these things are being experienced within a facility. So we overlay that actually in our software platform onto a facility floor plan. And you almost get kind of a Doppler radar effect or a heat map view of the frequency of indicators that are being experienced by workers in those areas. And then last would be um, we've got a, a button on the front of the device that allows a worker to push it and hold it and they can record up to a 15 second voice memo. And that's intended to increase the communication of near miss occurrences or just enable smooth and easy reporting of observations from the front lines. So every safety manager and every loss loss control guy or gal says that this is the kind of data that everybody wants more of, right? This is leading indicators of risk and near misses that we all want to see. Yet everybody also agrees that a huge percentage of those things never get reported. So we've created an automatic automated way to collect that data provided to leaders for better decision making. And, and, and uh, let's talk about connectivity. Is this a wireless solution or do you have to wait until it's docked in the storage bay for it to transfer all the information off the device? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I'll also add, because you asked earlier, that is in, in real time or, you know, our uh, tech uh, gurus like me to say near real time. It takes about 30 to 45 seconds for that data to be gathered from a wearable on an individual worker and show up in our software dashboards. Uh, the data is sent from the wearable device back to uh, a wall-mounted kiosk that we call our base station, and that's sent via Wi-Fi. And then that base station, which kind of looks like a time clock by design, it hangs on a wall, it's where workers check in and check out a device uh, at the beginning of their shift, that's connected to the internet, and then again, 30 to 45 seconds before that shows up in our cloud-based software platform. Can you use this as a time clock? Yeah, we can integrate with all kinds of things. Uh, That certainly is uh, uh, one of the capabilities that we have if somebody is using a cloud-based time clock system. Yep, and we've had lots of inquiries actually to help us understand how big a problem it is that for for some organizations uh, need to know what job role or what location, what area of a facility workers are working in currently because pay rates might fluctuate from an insurance point of view, the risk profile might fluctuate. So that's something uh, we're excited about the possibility of of doing those things in the future. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about 
And well, we're going to jump in. I know Rob has some great questions here, but I just want to understand how this works. You know, I'm a, I'm a gearhead. So I, I've been writing software for the last uh, 30 years and I, I, I like to understand how this all works. <clears throat> You're making a point to say no biometrics or personal information, no haptic feedback. I'm guessing to, 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 to soothe privacy concerns. I'm guessing that's why you're saying that. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. Um, we, of course, want to respect for uh, respect worker privacy. So that's part of our, our tenants. I think there's a lot of resistance in the mind of the worker about being tracked. I mean, we're not in, at all endeavoring to do that or collecting anything that is biometric or looking inward at the worker. Instead, we're looking out into the environment. We're collecting data about risks and hazards from on the worker. And that data that's collected from Rob today might indicate a hazard that can be uh, remediated so that James isn't hurt on the assembly line tomorrow. Awesome. And, and I've interviewed some other solutions like Spotter from Triax and others that, that get into slip trip fall detection, you know, an SOS button. I haven't seen the, the recording voice. That's actually a, a, a completely unique feature. I mean, I, you know, I've been, been doing this a while. And of all the solutions I looked at, I haven't seen voice reporting. So I like the voice reporting features. Slip trip fall is fairly common at this point, but com- but comboing sound exposure and air quality, heat and light, that combination I have not seen in a simple worker wearable. I've seen it in standalone units. You know, like there, there's there's another system out there called Pillar that does the, these standalone units that aren't on workers. But you're right, you can have vastly different environmental conditions 10 or 5 feet away. So it makes a ton of sense. It's almost like we're, we're just arriving at the point where all this can be miniaturized enough to actually be on a worker. Because until now, it had to be on a base station, right? Yeah, very true. Thanks for pointing that out. We think that that voice reporting feature uh, is one of the things that sets us apart. Keep in mind that you know there's a ro- robust array of sensors. We're collecting an awful lot of data. We're doing that actually costing tens of dollars per employee. It's not hundreds or thousands, so very economical. Uh, but we hear things on voice memos all the time, like I'm back here in a dark corner of the warehouse and there's a stack of pallets, material looks like it's going to fall over, right? Or somebody coming into the facility first thing in the morning saying, I think maintenance must have painted the floors in our area. And I'm guessing they may have used the wrong paint because it's slippery as an ice rink back here. We've had uh, voice memos that indicate to safety leaders, opportunity or operations leaders, opportunities for uh, quality improvements, for process reengineering. So, um, you know, we're, we're sticking to our guns. We, we uh, aren't uh, trying to infringe on the privacy or the perception by the worker. You know, it's been interesting, even in organized labor union environments, when we're brought to the table with heads of the union and uh, uh, executive management team, uh, you know, I've had some rocky starts to those meetings. They're not, they're not fans of each other, typically. And five minutes in, it's great to look at, you know, another Make You Safe team member and realize that they're now convincing each other about why use of make you safe is a good idea. And we haven't had to speak for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, because they, and, and I've, I've done a lot of work with labor unions. We're going to talk about labor unions in a second. So I'm going to bookmark that. Rob had a really good comment slash question about make you safe and wearables and PPE. Rob. Yeah. Thanks, James. So uh, Tom, great, great background. And, and thanks. It's just amazing. Right. Uh, as James pointed out, the miniaturization and being able to put all those sensors on something that's the, what would you say the size of your thumb? I mean, it's pretty incredible. Um, so you've talked about um, the big you safe wearables in uh, kind of industrial or, or manufacturing uh, facilities. One of the things I've heard you say before is, is that the wearable should be viewed as a piece of, of PPE, you know, no different than a hard hat, safety goggles, uh, earplugs, things like that. So um, I'd love to have you kind of expand on that idea because I, I, I think it's not, you know, it's just a different mindset, right, than uh, what we typically think of as, as PPE. And then also would l- like you to talk about um, construction exposure and kind of what does that look like? You talked about, um, you know, Wi-Fi, right, and transmission of data, but, but you know, how do you accomplish that on a job site? Yeah, thanks for that. Great question. Uh, so we say that a lot. We want Make You Safe armbands to be viewed 
like PPE because it's that simple to put them on at the beginning of your shift, just like hearing protection, just like safety glasses. Um, and we're extremely low cost, right? Like buying a pretty good pair of, of work gloves. Uh, on the other hand, it's so much more than that. Uh, safety professionals certainly know and are trained in uh, their discipline and loss control teams certainly know about uh, the hierarchy of controls. And uh, at the bottom of that hierarchy, the least uh, desirable method to protect people from hazards is actually PPE. The most desirable, the top of that pyramid would include things like removing the hazard entirely or uh, replacing or uh, substituting what, how people are doing things, um, isolating the worker from the hazard. In order to be able to do that, though, you need some kind of leading indicator data that tells you that there's a hazard that exists before people get hurt. So that's really what we're doing. We're providing that leading indicator data in a very easy to deploy and easy to get access to kind of way. Often when people hear that term, leading indicators as opposed to lagging indicators, which means something's happened, people got hurt. Leading indicators, you know, Im implies that you've got to either build your own systems or mine data from existing systems or change your workflows in order to get access to that kind of data. We, we were able to do that after a, a half day of setup in an industrial facility and immediately out of the, the gate, we start to see data come in that may, you know, show correlations between things like, for example, you know, we see an increased uh, percentage of slips and trips in the loading dock area when humidity is on the rise. Why? Well, there may be condensation that's starting to accumulate at a certain time of day on the concrete, right? So that's a leading indicator before things happen. Um, we can take in data from other so sources and show that alongside our people data that may provide further context. But that's really what we're what we're endeavoring to do is provide an easy way to get access to uh, indicators so that safety leaders can employ uh, the most desirable, most effective methods of controlling uh, hazards and risks and eliminating the potential for people to get hurt. And then your second question was the construction industry. Yeah, when we uh, started uh, Make You Safe, we used to frequently say that we were most appropriate to fixed workplaces. In other words, a facility or a factory where people go to work and they're working in one place. Until you know, the construction industry started to talk to us and uh, point out that the first things that happen these days on a construction job site is the job trailer goes in and then they run power and then they run an internet connection because so many things have to connect to it. So uh, that's all really we need uh, for our system to work. Uh, and we've started working with construction companies on their job sites. Um, really exciting to us to see very, very recently that uh, a very large uh, construction company working on an important data center project here uh, has increased their usage of Make You Safe by covering five times as many employees after only 60 days of experience with our tool. And now we're talking to uh, their work comp carrier because they're interested and uh, looking at other job sites around the country that they have projects. It looks like you, you're working with Whites, which is a fantastic place to start. I mean, talk about a, a top-notch Midwest contractor. Yeah, uh, very committed safety leaders. Uh, you know, it's really encouraging to walk into a meeting and at the back of the room, they have a bulletin board that says uh, frontline observation reports and they're, they're posting all of them there uh, because they value them. And then another that says, you told us on one side of a column and in the next column, here's what we did. So they're trying to get that uh, engagement from employees, understand uh, indicators, 
and uh, then show that they're acting upon them. And that's really what our tool does in a much more automated way. So let's let's jump in and go back to a topic that I've kind of bookmarked earlier with labor unions, because this, this applies to more than just construction, obviously manufacturing. There's a lot of sectors, industrial, where you have labor unions. And I've done a lot of work with labor unions. The role of labor unions has drastically changed in the last 30 years, big time. And the, their attitude, their approach, uh, I, I work with some very, very progressive labor unions that I'm 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 always quite pleased to see how how aggressive they're being about technology adoption. This has been a sticky topic though. You know, anything that involves putting something on a worker <laughs> in general, whether it's a hat or gloves or whatever it is, they they get really really particular and there's a lot of I'm, I'm not going to go into all the reasons why they're really particular. Um some are really really justified. So just tell me about you you mentioned you've had meetings with management and labor I want to hear what, what labor unions, when they first walked in, they were probably ready for war. I imagine they were bristled and, and bound up and ready for war. What? Tell me what they heard, what they saw that changed their minds, and then tell me what they, what they said when they did change their mind. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking. Um, I think when we start to talk about what the Make You Safe wearable collects, and also I kind of like to say what we're not doing right? Um, that has an impact. So we're collecting data about the environment and we're looking outward, trying to act as an advocate for the worker and give optics into actual working conditions that uh, workers are facing when doing their jobs. Uh, what we're not doing is anything personal, as we mentioned. Uh, we're not giving any haptic feedback to the worker. There's no buzzers or bells or whistles that go off that could interrupt people's work. And, you know, as a, uh, as an HR guy, as a leadership development guy, I really don't think it has a positive lasting effect. Anytime you're constantly telling somebody they're doing something wrong. So for that reason, we're not setting off buzzers. This is a one way communication tool. And really the intent here, if you think about it is to provide data to safety leadership to make sure that they're acting upon it. So we're holding them accountable. And when you start to paint that picture, this isn't anything that's going to be used for punitive purposes about the worker. And in fact, in some union environments, we've even been asked to uh, not identify which worker is wearing a wearable, but just show a number. So worker one through, you know, worker 100 or whatever. Uh, but instead, Providing that data to safety leadership uh, allows them to uh, start to engage in conversations to really understand what's being faced on the front lines and then uh, to track hazards that are identified to make sure that they get resolved, uh, to create tasks. Uh, and those are the kinds of things that we do in our software platform. So, you know, the, the worker has a wearable on. But uh, really, the data that's being collected is data that can be used to ensure a safe workplace for them and their coworkers. Awesome. I know, Rob, you've got a let's bring it back to insurance. Rob, I know you've got a great question about how this pulls back to insurance. Yeah, Tom. So we've talked about some of the industries that that you guys work with. And, and I know you've worked in uh, all sorts of environments, um, some some very volatile environments, right? Uh I don't know if it was a smelting facility or something like that. I mean, so you've you've definitely worked in some some environments that maybe people might not think uh, that these types of of devices could work. Uh, but yeah, I definitely want to take it to the insurance side, of course, right? Uh, that's that's it's my background and, and passion. And so um, you kind of mentioned uh, uh, you know work comp carrier as well as a. a you know, working with um, you know an employer. Yeah, I'm just kind of curious from it from an agent broker perspective as well as a carrier perspective. You know, what do those relationships look like? Um, you know, what conversations have you have, and what relationships uh, do you have, and and kind of what's that perspective? And is that a, a value prop? You know, could they save money on their their premiums by reducing workplace injuries? Yeah, that's certainly the vision, um, and we would like to be ubiquitous. Right, use make you safe like using a smoke detector, get a you know, or a house alarm, get a credit on your policy. Uh, so one day, hopefully, soon we'll get there. 
Um, we're working with numerous uh, carriers, I think, uh, uh, almost on double digits. Uh, we just officially launched our product into the marketplace uh, at the beginning of this year. We got our first shipment of saleable inventory the week that COVID lockdown started in our country, which was kind of interesting. Um, but uh, we have uh, sound, uh, solid commitments from uh, all kinds of insurers, uh, carriers, agents, brokers. And you're right, from the carrier side, you know, there's an appetite, uh, certainly in loss control, for this kind of data. And uh, you know, we're even starting to explore uh, ideas like enabling virtual loss control when, when reps can't get out into the field to do field visits. We've got a dashboard that shows indicators and trends and enables them to communicate and engage with safety leadership on the front lines and kind of is a lever for them to pull to influence uh, risk mitigation within policyholder organizations. Um, from an agent or broker perspective, uh, we've learned that this can be a significant differentiator. Um, you know, there are uh, high mod score specialists, right? Companies that, that will work with uh, companies in a very hands-on way, this is a terrific tool for them. We've had uh, uh, all kinds of, of arrangements with insurers, really, those that want to buy our hardware and give it away to their policyholders. Uh, often that's you know, a way for them to get started, uh, find a, a, a few good fit policyholders, um, introduce us, and we can take it from there. Uh, with installation and setup and deployment, and then the insurer has access to that data. Uh, we've got insurer examples now of policyholders actually requesting upon, before they will renew that uh, they want access to make you safe. So they want that to be included, sometimes even as a premium, as I understand, at a premium, I understand. Um, we've got examples where, oh, insurers. Uh, will write business when uh, Make You Safe is being utilized and building discounts and credits uh, around use of Make You Safe. So uh, we've uh, we've come quite far, pretty fast. Things are are very swift moving for us. Um, we're interested in in of course talking with insurers about ways that we can work with them and collaborate with them and coming up with arrangements that are are you know, beneficial. Uh, we've gotten a lot of traction in innovation departments. Uh, and I think it's interesting these days after what we're all experiencing with COVID, um, I, I, I believe we're now being viewed as pretty practical, right? Low cost. Uh, and therefore, why can't we get started with this right away? This doesn't need to be a long drawn out, you know, innovation uh, uh, project. Instead, cheap and easy, put the Make You Safe guys to work. Uh, we got a, a fleet of, of cool vans we call the Make You Vans. And, you know, we're looking to get out into people's facilities and set up and teach them how to use our tool and work with insurers as so, well. So, then, wait, well, I have to pause you there then. If you're, if you're doing installation and setup, then you're going to be limited by your distribution capacity. So how, how are you distributing the product then? Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, uh, we're doing that all ourselves right now. We're producing a limited quantity of our hardware solution for 2020. Um, and that's manageable. We've grown our team substantially. In fact, this week, I think we hired our 21st person and I haven't met them yet. That's a far cry from 18 months ago when there were two co-founders and myself <laughs> within Make You Safe. So uh, we've grown, um, we've got about 40% uh, uh, or so of that capacity for 2020 filled. Uh, nothing canceled. Uh, which is nice. We've just been waiting for facilities to open up and we've been a little bit delayed in getting out into the field and deploying. And you're right, James, we, you know, might have to uh, consider uh, when we could schedule a visit to, you know, Europe or Alaska. On the other hand, I think we're doing our first international deployment uh, within a matter of weeks uh, this month. So, uh, 
it's not very hard to set up and deploy. We do a lot of intake of details um, remotely and we pre-configure the hardware. So in essence, when we walk into a facility, we plug in that base station, uh, we, we determine work areas or workstations or zones on that facility floor plan, and then uh, we're off to the races. So, Is there a thought to partner with like a United Rentals so that you can leverage their distribution network and their install network, et cetera? I mean, because, you know, just at scale, there's, there's 28,000 major contractors just in the United States, right? I mean, you, you, this is not a, that's just construction. That's not manufacturing. That's not industrial. That's not oil and gas. That's, I mean, it's not distribution where you obviously could, could use this in, in, in logistics and distribution as well. I mean, <laughs> you know, it just, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, now, really good follow-up. I get your point. Our, our goal really is to provide a white glove kind of experience for users. And therefore, uh, we're not, you know, trying to cover uh, everywhere we possibly can. We're looking for the right partners within the insurers, as well as uh, industrial end users. And, you know, Rob and I have talked about this before. I think the ideal user for us, whether it be an insurer or an industrial end user, has to kind of have a certain maturity level to them. There needs to be an appetite, a desire for data, and then an ability to act on it as well, do something about it. So, you know, further, we need to work with our customers to train them how to derive value out of use of our tool. And it's a new technology. So we think that if we do that well, um, you know, scaling and growth, uh, will certainly uh, be something we're poised for in years to come. Uh, and that's been our experience so far. Um, awesome. Awesome. Rob? Guys, yeah, so I got another two-parter for you, Tom. Uh, so um, I, I'm curious a little bit more. Maybe you can talk about the the type of data that, you know, safety leaders, you know, insurers, et cetera, like are getting access to. I know your dashboard's called the the Make You Smart. So I, I love you talked about, you know, Make You Safe, of course, and the Make You Vans, right? So you've got the the Make You Smart dashboard. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the 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 data and and, and insights that you're able to to deliver. And then my second part of my question is um, maybe you could talk about um, your ability to introduce new functionality on the wearable. So, you know, you have a hardware and a, and a software piece to this. And um, I know during COVID, um, you were able to relatively quickly deploy um, contact tracing, worker density mapping, et cetera. So we'd love to have you kind of talk about some of those uh, recent enhancements you've been able to make. Yeah, sure. So you're right. Our software platform is called Make You Smart. Um, I'd be remiss, by the way, if I didn't point out that M-A-K-U, uh, make you or mock you, is Hawaiian for risk, apparently, which we didn't know when we named the company, but it's kind of fun. Um, so in our, our Make You Smart platform, uh, we're uh, fully responsive. So on any device, safety leaders and loss control insurers have access to data. And what they're seeing there is really... Things like uh, environmental indicators that are occurring right now, uh, motion indicators, slips, trips that are occurring right now, who those things have occurred to, where they've occurred. And in addition uh, to those indicators, which I would describe as kind of the granular detail, the building blocks of our, our platform, we're, we're taking things to another level. I, I say that's safety or risk intelligence. By using machine learning and AI to identify trends and look for correlations between data points. So I was giving an example earlier, right? But we may see that there's a, uh, a trend of low light being experienced by a couple of workers working in a particular area, right? Might investigate that and see uh, that there's light bulbs out. Um, we've seen, you know, companies with surprisingly sophisticated hearing conservation programs uh, be blown away when our technology was telling them that there were a couple of workers that were achieving their daily sound dosage within the first couple of hours of their shift. They weren't aware of that. So it caused them to reevaluate their hearing protection, things like that. In addition, um, we're able to now, uh, after the release of what we call Make You Smart 2.0, 
Uh, we've built in some workflow tools into our platform. So you can create a hazard, you can track that, you can take action against it, and you can show sometimes for a safety leader, this isn't a very easy thing to do, but you can show results of your work over time and the impact that it's making, the decrease on indicators or trends. Um, we've got uh, task lists that are that are included now. Um, you know, I uh, recommend all the time that that the frontline workers shouldn't just be the only ones wearing our device, but so should the leadership team. And if they're walking around leaving themselves voice memos, right, that's the visual inspection that everybody knows they do when they walk down a hallway and think about, well, that sign's missing and this is an obstruction on the floor. So those things go directly into our platform and it helps make management more effective and efficient. But it's also a lead by example. I mean, it, it, you know, look, if the if the leadership's willing to wear it, everybody's like, all right, I guess I am too. Right. I mean, my my business partner, Sebastian Costa, world's he's just amazing. Like one of the best people in the world, man. And he he holds me accountable all the time on this. In fact, we had our quarterly conversation today. We do 90 day reviews at JBK. We don't do annual reviews. And we were doing our quarterly today, and, and uh, I was thanking him for holding me accountable. There was one time we were walking to the parking spot, and I had not parked in the where everybody else parks that day. I had parked up closer to the building. I, I was in a hurry, and I just I was like, ah, ah heck, I'm going to park in front of the building. Man, he, he jumped on me. He goes, you got to park with everybody else. And I said, all right, you got it. I didn't fight him on it. And, and, it, and it's, it's just lead by example, right? I mean, it, it, there are people who don't like wearing things. There's people who don't like wearing masks. A lot of them. <laughs> we found out like half the world doesn't like wearing a mask. And, and there's people who don't like wearing things on their arms. What I, what I do like is how low form factor what you have is. I mean, it, that is small and lightweight. So you probably forget that you're wearing it, I would imagine. Um, That's the, uh, we call that a compliment when that happens, right? Somebody forgets they had it on and wears it home. In fact, Rob, you alluded to this earlier. We've been at work in some pretty demanding environments, like right out of the right out of the movies, uh, you know, smoke and air quality and things like that. And the only time we've ever had a device fail is when somebody took it home, took their coveralls off, and put it in the washer and dryer. <laughs> uh, it still powered up, but it it, it was in rough shape. After yeah, that, probably, but, probably got probably got fried at that point, but. Uh, yeah. Man, that, that's Rob, great. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Rob asked another question also, though, um, that I think kind of goes to, you know, what you're talking about, walking the talk, right? We want to do that, too. Our mission really is to make sure that that everybody goes home safely at the day end of the day. And, you know, there's not an empty seat at the dinner table that a, that a family isn't impacted. And um, we listen to our customers. I think that's part of of our recipe for success and what's helped us move along so quickly. To that point, when COVID hit, we stayed in touch with uh, all of the prospective customers that had signed up early uh, to use Make You Safe, and we're waiting like we were for our first uh, inventory of saleable product. And we asked them daily sometimes about the challenges that they were facing and how things were going for themselves and their workers and you know, what they were dealing with. And uh, quite honestly, we learned some things that weren't even in our vernacular last year, like uh, contact tracing. And uh, we started to think about how data we were already collecting, which isn't an infringement on worker privacy. We're not continuously tracking people, but we certainly can show uh, things like when workers have come in contact with other workers and the number of times their wearables have been in the same area over time. So that uh, allowed us to announce that capability. So we can, we can generate an on-demand contact tracing report uh, in the event, you know, which has happened, by the way, the day we, we announced it and released it. Uh, we got a call from a customer that said, I just had an employee come in my office you guys were just telling me this, and they said that a family member has been exposed or diagnosed, and I was able to turn to your system and look at that contact tracing report uh, and begin to focus my efforts on who I needed to communicate with and interview with. Um, we've also uh, released something that we call worker density mapping, so we can show density of workers throughout a facility over time. 
and there are areas that are obvious that management has been paying attention to, like you know, plexiglass dividers between workstations because we know these people are close to one another. On the other hand, they may not be aware of the density of the population in other areas of the facility over time. So we give them that, you know, graphic view of uh, their location and where people are traveling. And we're, we're, I can't talk about an awful lot, but we're awfully excited about the things that we have in research and development that also may go to uh, managing, uh, COVID and other infectious disease spread and, um, you know, uh, some things that, that, uh, don't involve the use of a personal mobile device. Uh, that's, you know, all the rage for, for some large companies to talk about these days and, uh, aren't, you know, uh, big brotherish or creepy. (laughs) So that's all. That's so awesome. Well, we, we, do, we are out of time for the interview. We just have a few minutes of news just to talk about what's new and going on in the insurance world, and particularly in InsurTech. So just hang with us there for a second, Tom. Uh, Rob, I'll give you my – I have two stories this week that I thought were worth talking about with us. The first one was from Insurance Business America. This is by um, Bethan Moorcraft. Incumbents, quote, incumbents must innovate before innovators find distribution. And this is – I love this. It's like right. – like, they're coming. They're coming over the hill. Like it's, it's, it's a, I love it. Cause you haven't really heard anybody phrase it that way before they find distribution. Cause once they find distribution game over. Right. right. And uh, I, I loved this article. Uh, Cause they're talking about just the number, you know, the sheer number of agents, agencies, uh, how many retail agents there are. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the direct model, obviously uh, there's just a lot of threats. Um, uh, that that to to traditional business models, and if if you have a chance, go to insurancebusinessbag.com dot com and uh, and read through it. But what I wanted to talk about with you, Rob, was really that main comment is um, there's a there's a timer, there's a clock running now about you know the the new and the the new insure tech, the digital MGAs, the digital carriers. There's a clock running to once they find full distribution, it's going to be a radically different insurance market. No. Yeah, absolutely. And and we might have touched on this in an earlier podcast, James, where, you know, one of the things that's been fascinating is some of the startups that are, are acting as MGAs that may be thinking about going carries it that originally started going direct, right? Like a progressive, Geico, USA, et cetera, that then have kind of pivoted, right? And realized, oh, those independent agents, maybe those aren't dinosaurs I just need to go past. They actually hold the, the keys to the castle because they're the link to the distribution side of things. So, you know, everyone's got different philosophies, whatever, but but exactly their point. We've even talked to to uh, folks like Darcy Shapiro, cover genius, right, about kind of, hey, those non-traditional distribution channels of being on the travel website, for example, right, and offering coverage there and whatnot. So, yeah, I, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think that's very, very timely for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, look, um, just go, go, everybody out there in listener land, go read the article. Distribution's everything in pretty much every industry, and it's everything in insurance as well. Uh, it's, just like I was just talking with Tom, I was really talking about distribution challenges, right? And that that's really the the issue. That there's some really brilliant um, ideas out there on insurance. And and the second article I have, Rob, is directly tied to distribution. It's almost like I'm from South Louisiana. And so you have so many natural disasters that happen in South Louisiana. I mean, you got floods, you got hurricanes, you have tornadoes that spin off from hurricanes, you have you know, pretty much every kind of uh, poisonous reptile on the planet lives in Louisiana. You know, there's a lot of things that can kill you down there. Maybe you get a little immune to it. And you always think that everything, there's something bad is going to happen to everybody else. I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a, a, a fancy academic phrase for this, you know, like the not me paradox or something. People just don't think it's going to happen to them. And I feel like every industry assumes they're not going to be disrupted by the likes of Amazon. I feel like they do. I feel like the, well, you know, Amazon really disrupted retail and books. Oh, and shipping and, oh, yeah, and the cloud. And, oh, yeah, I, I, I get it. They're eating the world, but they're not going to hit my industry. Um, it helps to watch world news. Good old Amazon has 100 million registered users in India now, registered customers, 100 million. And um, they're doing something really interesting. In July, that's just uh, about a month ago, Amazon partnered with ACO General Insurance, a digital insurance startup in India, to offer auto insurance in India through Amazon. 
So you can use Amazon Pay to buy. You can use the Amazon app. You can use the website. And now Amazon is an insurance distribution channel for their partner in insurance. Now, you, you can bet they probably, with more money than pretty much uh, most small sovereign nations, Amazon has the ability to probably buy this startup. They're probably just testing it out. But what I think many I've heard said won't happen, oh, I mean, Amazon is not going to get an insurance. Amazon's an insurance <clears throat> with 100 million people <laughs> as their test bed. Rob, I got I to gotta hear it. These, these, are, these are two stories about distribution. Talk to me. Yeah, so obviously long rumored, right? Amazon, folks have talked about Google and and, and others. And um, you know, we've said like whenever they they think there's enough value there, right? Insurance tends to be kind of low profit margin, right? It really ties up your capital for, you know, mid single digit returns. And so it hasn't made sense for a lot of these, you know, big tech companies to to get in. But you're absolutely right. Um, they've actually done a ton in India and um, it's funny, like, you know, it's, it's kind of off our radar here in the U.S., but like you said, 100 billion, I mean, it's it's crazy, right? It, clearly, India is in a, a small co- a company. And um, yeah, there's a ton of stuff they can do, right? Health, right? PNC and all that. So um, definitely a space to, to watch. And um, yeah, I think it's actually more important than ever to kind of be aware of, of what's going on internationally. There's so many co- co- companies trying different things in, in other countries. So if you're, if you're really U.S. focused or you know, Western Europe focus, you're going to miss uh, a lot of stuff. That's yeah. Going on. Pull your head out. Right. I mean, it's a uh, car and motorcycle insurance first. And it's on the, it's on the Amazon app and mobile website. Uh, they're not going to stop there. You know, WhatsApp, which of course is the most popular messaging application in the world rolls out uh, WhatsApp pay that deb- debuted in India in 2018. And uh, it'll be available for 400 million users once the Reserve Bank of India gives it a green light. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I mean, you're talking about user pilots that are larger than the entire population of the United States. So just wrap your brain around it. It's a very mobile world out there, uh, in particular outside the United States. You know, I have offices in Africa. I've got employees over there. We, we've done a lot of work with folks in India. I mean, it is a very, very mobile friendly world out there. And and there's people that are looking to make it very simple to live your entire life through your mobile device. And uh, if it's not here, it's, it's coming soon. And uh, if it's, if it's being piloted in India, it, it will, it, it will be replicated here at some point in time. Rob, you got anything this week? Yeah. Just to add to that one point, James, I mean, your mobile phone is the ultimate distribution device, right? And so if it can be done on the phone, eventually it will be done on the phone. So um, you're spot on there. And I got one quick one for you. So um, you might have seen this headline. Um, it was in several publications. I'm looking at the insurance journal right now. So uh, paper, vi- paper Mile Car Insurer Metro Mile signs a deal with Ford. Um, and so they're going to be integrated into to Ford cars. And uh, if you have that connected car kind of with Ford, you're going to be able to basically – opt in your car to sign up and to insure with uh, Metro Mile. Um, so obviously, particularly during the pandemic, right, a lot of people are driving a whole lot less than they've done before. Um, some of us have to take our cars out like once a week because we're, we're, you know, we're not commuting to work or anything like that. So uh, it actually, I guess, is an, another distribution play builds on that theme. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on, a, on an insurance startup integrating uh, directly with an OEM. Tom, well, James, what do you guys think? Uh, it- Again, it's all about distribution. Uh, Tesla, if you just go to tesla.com slash insurance, you can get a quote right there through Tesla on the Tesla website. That's step one, right? Just They became a licensed agent. They even give their agency license number. They have Tesla insurance services. And, you know, so they're, they start with the easy play. Of course, Tesla collects more data from the car than any other manufacturer that I've seen. Musk has made it clear with Tesla that he intends to it, it to be a massive rideshare network as well so that owners can lease their cars to the rideshare network. And then, of course, provide, I'm sure, paper mile insurance because right now they're doing pretty traditional quoting. But paper mile tied in with the vehicle so you know they're not pulling that dongle out of the OBD2 port, right? Like, you know, you know they can't do that. They can't cheat uh, on that. That's pretty powerful. Uh, Tom, you know, this is really similar to what, what y'all are doing, right? It's a, it's a wearable for a car at, at some level, right? I've actually said that before, right? And now, you know, we're telematics for people. Um, now there's data that shows that uh, behavior has changed, even when the data isn't being used, you know, punitively. People have tried to change their driving habits. 
Um, and yeah, that's the same kind of mission we have. Um, you know, collecting this data can help safety leaders send everybody home safely at the end of the day. Um, so nice to be with you guys. Thanks for including me in the conversation. Oh yeah, sure. And and um, a little side note, not insurance related. Elon Musk has another company, and, and I'm a I am a Musk fan. Okay, uh, I was a huge fan of Steve Jobs, and for me, Edison, Nikola Tesla, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, like that. I I almost feel like they're these absolute titans of innovation. So Neuralink, did you guys watch the demo video for Neuralink? I mean, we talk about telematics for humans, but Neuralink takes it to a next level, um, an implant in the brain. Uh, so he put a 1,024-channel implant into a pig brain of an actual live pig and uh, then started reading all the data off of it, did a demo this past week, and it is worth watching. Um, every time they would touch, pigs love having their nose touched, so they have a lot of, a lot of a huge sensor array in their noses, and they would just very gently touch the pig's nose and... Uh, they would measure all and the responses that you came gotta, off. Of. You got to come to Iowa. <laughs> We've got an awful lot of swine wearable companies and startups and innovation that's happening here. So yeah, yeah, this is yeah, this is like totally next level. They implanted. Yeah, you're in town. Yeah, yeah, they 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 very safely implanted the the chip inside the pig's brain. Uh, there was there was nothing the chip that the pig was uh, was wearing, but it, I mean it it was uh, it was pretty fascinating. And uh, I, I would I would encourage you to check it out. It takes wearable to a completely new level. <laughs> so anyway, that's on that note. That's been our show. Uh, Tom, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you both for having me. Enjoyed and, the conversation. And as always, Rob Galbraith, uh, you are a man of intrigue. I appreciate you being here. I'm sorry you're still you're still your wings are still clipped. I can feel the anxiety. You can't go to these conferences, but uh, I know you're speaking at a bunch of them and, and having all kinds of fun. So uh, it's good to see you. Great to see you too, James. Absolutely. And thank you out there for joining us for the Insure Tech Geek Podcast powered by JB Knowledge. That's jbknowledge.com. It's all about technology. It's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. I'm your host, James Benham. It's jamesbenham.com with co-host Rob Galbraith, endofinsurance.com. Big thanks to Jim Greenlee, our podcast producer, Kara Dalton, our creative producer, and Adele Waldeck, our transcriptionist. And thank you for joining us today. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech. So enjoy the ride and geek out. See you next week.